Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to my talk. My name is Rachel Nye, and I work with Dr. Craig Parsons at North Carolina State University. Today, I'll be talking about my research on molecular layer deposition of polyurea and the associated transition from initial to steady state growth, which we can explore by changing the precursor structure. Now, I will begin with a brief introduction of molecular layer deposition, which is analogous to organic atomic layer deposition. So this process is a layer by layer thin film synthesis method relying on sequential vapor solid surface reactions where a precursor reacts with all active sites on a surface in a self-limiting way. And once all active sites are occupied, no more growth can occur for that cycle. And in this way, by repeating our cycles as many times as we want, we can get a very thin uh, controllable film where we control the thickness on the sub nanoscale and we can coat conformally on even high aspect ratio structures and complex shapes such as particles. Additionally, in MLD, you can tailor the functional groups for the structure of your organic precursors to achieve a desired film property or growth rate. Uh, this makes these films useful, for example, in battery electrode coatings or as photoresist and lithographic applications. However, as technology continues to advance, the requirements for these films and their performance and their thickness standards become more and more strict. And it is becoming increasingly difficult for our deposition to keep up to these commercial standards. Thus, a, mes a mechanistic fundamental understanding of the growth mechanisms would be very beneficial to improving film performance, our control over growth rate, over film thickness, and over film properties. And in this study, we seek to develop this mechanistic understanding by analyzing how different precursor structures can affect growth. We focus on polyurea molecular layer deposition, which is deposited from diamines and diisocyanates. So here I have shown two potential diamine reactants, one more flexible than the other. And the, the traditional diisocyanate reactant used, phenylene diisocyanate, to form polyurea. Now, this diisocyanate is, is almost always used in MLD for polyurea. However, it has a very low vapor pressure. It's a solid at room temperature, leading to practical hardware issues with valve clogging um, and requires heating, therefore, to be able to vaporize this enough to use in your MLD process. However, uh, we analyze the thermal stability of this material after he extended heating, like what you would see on an actual reactor. And we find that after heating, uh, this undergoes thermal degradation via dimerization, which you can see here from this FTIR plot by the disappearance of this highlighted isocyanate peak, uh, which disappears after a few months of heating. And instead we form a carbonyl peak. And this chemical transition is indicative of dimerization. And this dimer, this larger molecule, is not capable of being dosed into the reactor and not capable of an MLD reaction. Thus, it would be beneficial to have a more thermally stable alternative to use as the diisocyanate. Additionally, it could prove interesting to be able to test different structures. For example, a, an aliphatic group for this isocyanate rather than aromatic, so shown here. And for these reasons, we introduce hexamethylene diisocyanate to use as a new MLD precursor for polyurea or polyurethane. Uh, and here, of course, we start out by analyzing the thermal stability. Uh, again, we look, at, we look for a change in this isocyanate peak in FTIR. And again, after several months of heating at the required deposition temperature, we see, we see no significant change in this isocyanate peak and only a small presence of carbonyl, indicating some slight degradation, but, but not much. So this does seem to be a promising alternative, more thermally stable, higher vapor pressure to the standard aromatic substrate. Of course, our next step is to see, does this indeed grow a film? Now for this flexible monomer, uh, the structure again shown here, we are expecting many double reactions to take place. And now this occurs, you can see from the cartoon here, when both functional groups of our bifunctional molecule 
react with the surface in the same half cycle, thus terminating two active sites without generating a new site for continued growth. And for this reason, we are expecting a lower growth rate with our, our flexible aliphatic film. And that is exactly what we see. Uh, you can observe that from this QCM plot of mass uptake versus time. We have a much higher growth rate for our aromatic film. And you can even see cycle by cycle over here on the right. Then we have as mass uptake for our aliphatic film. Now we can expand this study on structures more by, again, pulling in that hexane diamine uh, precursor in addition to the ethylene diamine, which is what I'm showing here. Now we can compare two different diisocyanates with two different diamines, and we get a whole range of film structures with varying flexibilities. And we still see this trend of increasing film flexibility results in a lower growth rate, as we're expecting because of those frequent double reactions, site terminations. Now, you'll notice that there is significantly more difference between these films with the aromatic group incorporated, rather than once we move to a fully aliphatic film, even though we are getting more flexible, we don't see a very large change in growth rate. In fact, it's very insignificant, uh, if at all. So the aromatic precursor does play a big role in determining growth rate. Um, now, because these HDIC, these aliphatic polymers are newer, I'd also like to point out in a little bit more detail this, this nonlinear growth that you can see. So I will zoom in. Now I'm showing the growth rate as a function of cycle over the first 40 cycles on SiO2. And you see this rapid decrease in growth rate, uh, again, attributed to these double reactions, which are terminating active sites and thus leading to slower and slower growth. However, this growth rate does not reach zero. Instead, it eventually reaches a steady growth rate that's low but constant. And this is indicating some type of equilibrium being reached between the site termination reactions and site generation reactions. Now these could come from subsurface diffusion or physical adsorption reactions. For example, from strong hydrogen bonding in polyurea, also, also confirmed by FTIR, not shown here. And now the question becomes, if we see these very, this strong uh, difference, the significant difference in growth rate and growth behavior, can we somehow exploit that? Can we control these two regimes, for example, to maintain a higher growth rate for longer and get our deposited film more quickly? Or to completely terminate growth, for example, which could be useful in area selective deposition applications or patterning. So we start to analyze some factors that might affect our, our growth transition, the first of which is temperature. And you see that at low temperatures, at 30 degrees deposition, we see this strong uh, decrease in growth rate, like I just showed over the first several cycles on SiO2. However, at a higher temperature, at 100 degrees, now we have a very low but a very constant linear growth rate. And this, this steady state growth rate doesn't change that much based on temperature for these very flexible films. And we can expand this a little bit and look at a whole range of temperatures between 30 and 100 degrees. And with a decrease in temperature, we do see a, a more rapid initial growth rate that lasts for a bit longer and uh, overall, we're getting a more significant transition from, from initial growth to steady growth rate. So a more significant decrease overall, a higher nonlinear character, as you will. And thus we show that temperature is, is one avenue for controlling the linearity of growth in, in these films. Now we might also want to consider how the growth surface affects the growth rate itself. Of course, the, the active site density on the film which you are depositing on is, is going to determine your growth rate. So on SiO2, we're now looking at, at growth per cycle versus cycle for both the aromatic and the aliphatic polymers. And on SiO2, both of these undergo a, a decrease in growth rate, again, attributed to double reactions, which are expected to be more significant for the aliphatic film. And of course, when we look at now 
deposition on a homogeneous polymer surface. In other words, each film growing on itself, aromatic on aromatic or aliphatic on aliphatic, we see, of course, a, a constant growth rate because our, our active site density is not changing. And this is expected. Now, the next step then is what if we grow these polymers on each other? And will we see something different? Do they have a difference in active site density just based on structure, even while maintaining that same urea linkage chemistry? So when we deposit one polymer onto the other, we do in fact see very different trends in, in growth rate in this, this transition in growth. So the aromatic film, more rigid, being deposited on the more flexible, low active site density, aliphatic substrate, we actually see an increase in growth rate initially. So it, we're going from a lower site density to a higher site density. Now, and when you can see that here, this, this change now is likely associated with relative changes in site terminations, which would become less prevalent when we are depositing the aromatic film because it's rigid, it's not as flexible to, to reach two active sites at one time. And additionally, a change in at site generation rates could be possible as well. Now, when we look at the reverse, the aliphatic film being deposited on top of the rigid aromatic, we see the same trend as we see on SiO2. So a higher initial active site density, which is decreasing uh, down to a lower site density. Uh, so this is consistent with our, our idea that uh, silicon oxide has, has the highest active site density, followed by the aromatic film, followed by the aliphatic film. And thus we see in addition to temperature, our varying our precursor structure can also determine the active site density and the growth rate on, on, on this surface that we are depositing on. So why is this important? What can we use this for exactly? Understanding the relationships between site termination and site generation and how you can control that with a precursor or a substrate or a temperature. Firstly, if we can understand these transitions, we will be able to get more accurate thickness predictions, which of course are important, especially um, as device sizes are, are shrinking and we need thin films without clogging pores or, or pinching off trenches in microelectronics. It's also useful to be able to quantify and control active site density and thus growth rate on different types of surfaces in this case for area selective deposition applications where we are purposefully trying to induce a difference in growth rate on different surfaces. If we can achieve that or in enhance that difference just by changing precursors, uh, that's also very useful to know. Now, while these growth rates uh, and this growth behavior is a bit more complex than the traditional linear MLD or ALD that we expect, it is still possible to accurately describe them just with a very simple decay model. For example, the one shown here, this equation, where we can get our instantaneous growth rate at cycle N by taking into account a few factors. So our growth rate on the polymer, our steady state growth rate uh, on a homogeneous surface, the growth rate on, on our initial surface, in this case, SiO2, the cycle number, and then this for now, generic decay parameter. And when we, when we use this model and, and play with the decay parameter, we can get a very accurate prediction of thickness. So you can see here these solid lines representing the model and the, the data points from experimental work for each type of polymer. So this is this simple equation allows us in this observation, allows us to accurately predict um, and describe growth on the basis of which precursors we're using, uh, the deposition temperature, and in this case, all on an SiO2 substrate. Now, it would be desirable to introduce more in-depth kinetic modeling. That way we can relate this decay parameter to more physical uh, conditions, such as temperature and precursor uh, chain length or flexibility, and this have more predictive capabilities in moving forward. 
I would like to conclude now by again mentioning hexamethylene diisocyanate as a useful alternative precursor to the PDIC that's traditionally used as isocyanate in thin film deposition. And this flexible alternative, yeah, well, we have a lower growth rate, but we also can then deposit more flexible films, which may be useful, for example, in battery electrodes, which undergo volume expansion. And you need a coating that won't break or crack apart during, during device use. Um, and from this film, from this flexible deposition, we see different growth regimes, uh, which are very significant, especially for this very flexible film. And we can control these based on our deposition temperature, our precursor selection, and the growth surface. And in this case, we note that this transition in growth is more significant at lower temperatures and with our more flexible films. Again, all of this insight, this information is, is important to be able to accurately deposit films of a known predefined thickness and with, with known properties in, in any technological application. So finally, I would like to conclude by thanking my group, um, in particular, Xiao Wang, who also works very much on this project. And if there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Just send me an email. Thank you very much.